thank you very much for welcoming us to the University of Washington and your Bevan series on sustainable fisheries. Uh, we're very honored to be here. Uh, I am, as was mentioned, a wildlife biologist. Uh, my name is Kim Sager Bradkin, and I am going to do my best to tell the Elwha restoration story today from an ecological perspective related to salmon, sediment, plants, and wildlife. Um, so forgive me if I falter on any of the salmon bits of the story. Um, I have been gleaning information from all of my colleagues to be able to tell this complete Elwha restoration story, but it will be heavy on wildlife, just be forewarned. So off we go. Many of you probably have heard of Elwha restoration, I'm hoping so. Um, Elwha restoration at the time that it was completed, or at the time the dams came out, was the largest dam removal project ever undertaken in the world. Now we can call it the largest completed dam removal project ever undertaken in the world, because many of you probably know that the Klamath dams are coming out. They've been breached, it has been started, and so they will definitely overshadow in a good way the Elwha as the largest dam removal project ever undertaken in this country. The Elwha is an amazing watershed. It is a unique watershed. It's the largest watershed on the Olympic Peninsula. Let's just place ourselves. The northern extent of the watershed flows into the Strait of Juan de Fuca or the Salish Sea on the lower Elwha Clallam Reservation, uh, just west of Port Angeles. So north part of the Olympic Peninsula facing Victoria. And it is the largest watershed on the Olympic Peninsula. There is 45 um, miles long and is unique in that 83% of the watershed is protected within the boundaries of Olympic National Park. So while it was dammed for 100 years, the upstream habitats were relatively intact because of the protections of the National Park Service. When the dams first went in, the tribe knew this was not good for their culture, their subsistence, and this the sustenance upon which they relied. Vanessa's going to talk to you a lot about that later. But the tribes from the beginning fought for the removal of the Elwha dams, and I'm happy to tell you the science story behind that. The Elwha dam was built uh, over 100 years ago. 7.9 kilometers from the mouth of the river. It was a 33 meter concrete gravity dam. So shorter than the above river dam, but much wider. Um, removal of that dam, actually both dams began in September of 2011. And this dam was completely out by 2012. The Glines Canyon Dam further up river was built over 10 years later, 21 kilometers from the mouth of the river. It was a much taller dam. It was built at the head of a canyon, um, the Glines Canyon, 64 meter concrete arch dam. Removal began at the same time. This was a more complicated dam to remove and removal was more or less completed by August of 2014. However, in October of that year, there was a large rock fall that impeded fish passage up river. And so there were two blasting events in um, 2015 and 2016 that ultimately removed those barriers and allowed for upstream passage of salmonids. So let's talk about a roadmap for today. We're going to talk about some major drivers of ecosystem change in the Elwha. Um, the short-term impact in the Elwha was, Elwha was the pulse of sediment. We're also going to talk longer-term fish recolonization, plant restoration, and the return of wildlife to the restored lake beds. So let's start with the sediment. Oh, hold on, we're gonna get there. Um, I first need to acknowledge all of the partnerships. Dam removal would not have been possible without the leadership of the tribe um, and many, many federal departments, including the National Park Service. And the work that has been conducted since dam removal has been conducted by so many entities, federal entities, state entities, nonprofits, environmental organizations, and many universities. And this has definitely been a story of collaboration. What you're gonna see today is information that I have gleaned and taken from so many researchers from so many entities. So now we're gonna talk about sediment. How much sediment was built up behind the Elwha? A lot. 30 million tons of sediment was built up behind these two dams. A hundred years of sediment deposition, especially 
behind the Glines Canyon Dam that just did, was unable to move downstream. So we are talking about a third of a mile wide and as high as the pyramid at its peak, 500 feet high or a 50 story building, it's a lot of sediment. Um, and so what on earth was gonna happen to that sediment? That's a lot of mud. So where did it all go? This was a big question in the Alwa. What the heck was going to happen to all that mud? So all of the geomorphologists and sediment people have been out there um, and over the course of the years have determined that about 35% of the sediment stayed behind in the former reservoirs and that 65% or 19.3 million tons of sediment were released was released downriver. About 10% of it ended up in the river. And during the course of dam removal, this was a murky, murky river. Um, and you could feel like you were sinking in quicksand. And all of the sediment fundamentally changed, changed the downstream fluvial morphology of the Alwa River. We can see here that in 2011, we really, we had some braiding, but not um, a ton of meandering in the Alwa and not a lot of big gravel bars or sandbars. By 2013, just a year after the dam removals, um, we're seeing enlarged sandbars. And by 2016, a lot more river meander, a lot of wood deposition. There was also a lot of wood above those dams. Um, a lot of wood deposition and many enlarged bars. And just another vision of this, uh, we talked about this in some of the classes we were in today. This really went from a cobbly river that was pretty hard to walk on to a very sandy, murky river during, or um, gravel bars during dam removal, to now a really nice mix of fine sediment and cobbles. And of that release sediment, 26% uh, of it ended up in the estuary. And so again, during dam removal, it was very difficult to get around. So here are some folks trying to uh, install a um, data monitor in a lot of mud. But really 64% of the sediment that was released from the reservoirs went to the ocean. So during dam removal, you could see the sediment plume from space. There were lots of aerial images. This was a massive sediment plume that went out to the ocean. And that increased the size of the Elwha estuary at its maximum, the Elwha beach by over a hundred or about 130 hectares. So prior to dam removal, it was a really cobbly, rocky beach down at the mouth of the Elwha. And after dam removal and that huge flush of sediment came out, we had this huge um, beach and these amazing estuaries down at the mouth of the river and lots and lots of um, sandbars. Interestingly, without the flush of sed sediment continuing throughout the, uh, the watershed, we're actually seeing a retreat of that growth. This is a 2023 aerial. The wave action has been working its magic on the beach. It's still a sandy beach and it's still changing a lot. It's a very dynamic environment, but less, um, we're seeing sort of less sand and less of that growth now. And all of this new sediment at the mouth uh, improved the shoreline for a variety of species that rely upon more fine sediments like sand lance, surf smelt, flatfish like starry flounder, um, Dungeness crab and many other uh, invertebrates that were studied. That's one slide, sorry, that's all I had time for. <laughs> so let's talk about fishery colonization. Everybody wants to know the fish story. Um, I am in the School of Fishery, so I know that we need to tell the fish story um, and I'm going to do that rather quickly. Um, how have fish responded? You know, the one of the primary reasons for dam removal was to restore these historic runs of Elwha fish. Um, all species of anadromous fish from the Pacific coast were there and legendary, legendary 100 pound Chinook salmon. So would they come back? What is happening with the fish? Dam construction impacted the fish population dramatically. These dams were built without provisions for fish passage at all. So you put a concrete wall on a river you're gonna impact the fish. And so there was a 98% reduction in fish populations in the Elwha after the dams were built. That is dramatic. 
And it, it's also important to note that when you change populations, you also change species composition. Prior to the dams being built, estimates were that the vast majority of the, the fish coming back to the Elwha were pinks. Um, plenty of steelhead, coho, chinook, and some sockeye, but many, many pinks. After the dams went in, the Elwha really just about lost its pink run. Um, coho became the predominant fish in the river, steelhead, and part of this is because of hatcheries, um, and chinook, a small amount of chum and a very small amount of pink. These salmon populations, while they were in low abundance at the time of dam removal, the genetics were mostly intact. A lot of Elwha fish genetics were kept in the river through hatcheries, through a Chinook rearing um, channel and hatchery and the tribe's coho hatchery. Now let's look at post dam removal. Um, a colleague suggested I added the post dam removal bar to this graph. You know, it's underwhelming when you look at it compared to the pre-dam amount. But you know, this is two to three generations of fish. This is pretty awesome. This is more of a twofold increase in fish populations in two to three generations of fish. So while the numbers compare nothing to what we saw prior to dam removal, and I should also point out that this 400,000 guesstimate of what was there before the dams were built is cons very conservative and doesn't include some of the massive pink run years, which were estimated potentially to be up to a million fish. Um, so we're seeing a blip um, and we're seeing recovery happening, but it's slow. Restoration takes time. Fish restoration is gonna take a long time. Fish are impacted by a lot of other things in their environment. Um, and so we're just gonna see this play out. So, Colleagues um, and scientists working on the LWA use a variety of tools to measure fish response to dam removal. Everything from radio telemetry surveys to snorkel surveys to multi-beam sonar, red surveys, DNA, uh, screw traps, you name it, drift nets, a lot of things, uh, a lot of techniques are used to study the fish response in the LWA. So what have we learned? Um, at this point, if we look at the upper Elwha watershed, bull trout, winter and summer steelhead, and Chinook are all up there. Bull trout responded the most quickly, um, and winter and summer steelhead quickly after, as well as Chinook. We've got some stray sockeye, um, coho in the river, and then pink and chum down lower. These are all above the former Glines Canyon Dam, which is right here. Um, and if we look at a timeline, um, we can see right here is the beginning of dam removal. All of these orange are species that made it above the lower dam, the Elwha dam site. So we had the steelhead respond quickly, steelhead and Chinook, and then bull trout uh, at the end getting above the lower dam. But as soon as those upper dams, that upper dam came out and the rock fall was taken out, bull trout were very quick to get up and to get far upriver. Um, Chinook, the steelhead, and then chum have come in more recently. Let's look at some data from the Riverscape snorkel surveys conducted by a whole variety of researchers together. Um, so from 2007 to 2008, and this was mostly run by the National Park Service, and this is one of their graphs. From 2007 to 2008, there was a full extent uh, snorkel survey done in the Elwha. So we're talking like pretty much every snorkel bull reach was snorkeled. Um, and then these surveys were done again in 2018, 2019, after dam removal, several years after dam removal. And the numbers I'd like to point out really are the trout numbers, this dramatic increase. The Chinook numbers are dramatic. Um, of course, the summer steelhead were non-existent prior to dam removal. Um, so, and even bull trout, pretty dramatic increases, um, two times the bull trouts as seen before. And bull trout are an interesting story um, because of the reawakened um, anadromy, the life history anadromy um, that they started exhibiting. 
So they were the first to get up river. So within three years of dam removal, they reached the headwaters. And we're talking big fish. These guys were getting big, up to 700 millimeters, much bigger than pre-dam removal bull trout. And so their spatial extent and distance up river increased year after year after year. Steelhead also increased um, their anadromous or saw their anadromous life history come alive again. Summer steelhead were uh, harbored in the upper Elwha as resident rainbows prior to dam removal. Once the dams came out, they started to sort that uh, life history again and go to the ocean and come back upriver, far upriver. And the Riverscape surveys from 2008 and 2019, 2018 and 2019 really show us the dramatic increase um, upriver for these fish compared to the lower river. And again, we're seeing this up, up here in the upper parts of the Elwha. And this is predominantly, as I said, natural recolonization um, from fish that were sort of harboring in the upper watershed prior to dam removal. Winter steelhead, a little bit of a different story. Um, winter steelhead below the dams were there um, prior to dam removal, and these are red surveys. And then as soon as that lower dam came out, we were seeing a lot more reds between the dams. And then within a couple years of the rockfall being removed, more and more reds, of course, variable years, but more and more reds seen up river. And this is a component of this population is a hatchery is a hatchery run. So some natural recolonization, some hatchery. And a really a dramatic increase in numbers if we look from 2013 to 2021. Chinook, the king of the Elwha, the ones, the legendary 100 pound fish. Um, what is gonna happen with the Chinook? That has been a big question. Um, 2012, before the rock fall was removed, there were reds found above Aldwell. Um, and increasing reds throughout the years. And then the rockfall was taken out. We started seeing reds upriver of Glines Dam. Um, the Chinook story runs deep. I'm not gonna get into it at this point, but people can certainly ask questions. Vanessa knows a lot about them. Um, you know, they aren't getting upriver in the numbers that maybe some people would have expected yet, um, but that just is going to take time. There are potential reasons for that, but the Chinook are coming back and they are predominantly a hatchery origin fish still. The state had a Chinook program and the Elwha hatchery has taken over some component of that program now, that the tribe's hatchery. What about the coho? Uh, coho are increasing dramatically in numbers. Um, this is adults seen, as seen from multi-beam son sonar returning to the river. So a huge increase between 2019 and 2022. And it, the majority of these are still hatchery origin from the tribe's hatchery. And many of these are using not only the main stem, but tributaries, um, Little River, Indian Creek, and the former reservoirs. While they have established above Rika Canyon, above both dams, they have not yet been documented in the upper Elwha. What about the pink and the chum? Pink and chum were critically low in abundance in the Elwha at the beginning of dam removal. They did not do well with the dams in place. And then dam removal further depressed these populations because of that immense amount of sediment in the river. Um, however, these species have an amazing ability to bounce back. 2023 was a record year for pinks. So um, 2025 could be a great year. Fisheries biologists are keeping an eye on that. Uh, 2023 also saw an increase in outmigrants for chum. Other species, what about the other species? What about the lamprey? Um, the Elwha saw a 12 fold increase in Pacific lamprey spawning in the three years following dam removal. And 41% of this, in, this production was from Indian Creek. And then there are some sockeye strays coming into the system that seem to be predominantly from Alaska and British Columbia. I have two slides about benthic invertebrates. I cannot leave Sarah Morley's work out. Um, our colleague at NOAA, Sarah Morley, does an amazing amount of work in the Elwha looking at benthic invertebrates. Um, 
we've got some baselines here of before dam removal and during dam removal, that sediment was a problem or benthic invertebrates, too much sediment. Um, but since dam removal, huge bump in the diptera population in particular um, in the Elwha. So important food base. So moving on to plant restoration, huge, huge effort to restore the former Elwha reservoirs. Um, when these dams came out, there was 800 acres of complete moonscape. These habitats had been flooded for a hundred years. Um, and there was just no chance of plant life growing there uh, quickly without a little bit of human intervention. So there's been a massive revegetation program run by the National Park Service and the tribe, many, many, many years preceding the dam removal of seed collection, growing seeds in a greenhouse, growing plants, so much effort, an immense amount of effort to revegetate these places. So 525 acres across the two reservoirs were actively revegetated by humans. Um, over 5,000 pounds of seeds were sown into the reservoir beds, primarily grass um, and forb seeds. 403,000 trees, shrubs, and herbaceous plants were planted. And part of the goal here was, of course, to just jumpstart the restoration of these areas to stabilize sediments and to keep inv invasive species at bay. There are invasive species that have made it into the reservoirs, um, and there's sort of a, still an active eradication program and still active planting, especially on the lower reservoir. So we've seen a dramatic change in the two reservoirs. I should point out this, this second photo taken in April of 2018. Most of the plant life that you're seeing here was actually natural regeneration. Aldwell, Wildo, Willow, and Cottonwood came back quite well on their own, some of those early cereal species. So moving along, um, we have talked about sediment. Um, we have talked about fish. And we have talked about revegetation, but as a wildlife biologist, there were many of us, or actually a few of us, my, the minority in the Elwha research community that study wildlife, that really wanted to understand how would all of this, how would these ecosystem changes impact the wildlife? Um, so we commenced a series of studies to look at the wildlife response to dam removal and early Elwha restoration. And the reason that we were really interested in some of these species is we know, we all in this room know that salmon come back to rivers just chock full of marine derived nutrients and that these nutrients fertilize river systems and they enhance the freshwater nutrient pool. We also know that when you throw animals into the mix, they can really help to disperse these nutrients. They act as movement vector, vectors for moving nutrients into the surrounding forest. And they're also impacted by the increase in nutrients in their own diets. So a really interesting interaction between salmon nutrients and terrestrial wildlife and riverine wildlife. And we wanted to study that. Um, so prior to dam removal, actually, um, and this was my graduate work, we did a study from 2002 to 2006 in the Elwha looking at baseline patterns of bear distribution and relative abundance in the Elwha Valley. And very briefly, we found um, pretty interesting movement patterns, um, really looks kind of like tides throughout the year. Early spring, bears were at low elevation. Uh, as summer progressed, they moved into high elevations and pretty much every fall and late winter or fall, late fall, late summer, early fall and into winter, bears in the Elwha watershed were in the high country. There were no salmon to eat in the river. They were eating huckleberries and lots of them. Um, we also did a bear hair snare study in the Elwha where we collected hair samples. We determined at least 59 bears using the Elwha floodplain during three years. And the vast majority of that use was in the spring and not in the fall. So we have this baseline for comparison uh, in the future. We also conducted a series of baseline studies on amphibians, small mammals, and mesocarnivores all the way up to river kilometer 54. And we collected samples to get a baseline of stable isotope analysis in a system without salmon for comparison in future years. 
During dam removal, we studied river dependent wildlife that we knew would be directly impacted by dam removal and salmon recovery. And that was the American Dipper and the River Otter. Vanessa, do you want to say it? <laughs> um, the River Otter, we have the clallum name there. Um, so one of the goals of the River Otter study was to determine distribution and movement patterns of river otters in the Elwha and to use stabilized isotope analysis to examine the contribution of marine derived nutrients in the diets of otters. Uh, otters are buggers to work with. They're really hard to catch. Um, we caught for <laughs> somebody who worked on the project with me is laughing because she knows. Um, so over the course of our study, we caught 14 otters and implanted them with radio tracking devices and found that they moved widely throughout the Elwha watershed. Each color here indicates a different mm -hmm. otter um, and our radio tracking data. They moved widely into the marine environment as well along the coast. And we did stable isotope analysis. We collected claw, blood, and um, fur samples from each captured river otter. And I've reversed the, I, the Y axis here. And what we see is that with increased um, distance upriver above the dams, we had the lowest contribution of marine derived carbon and nitrogen as would be expected. These animals were not eating salmon. Um, animals that were caught and used areas low in the watershed had the highest contribution of marine derived carbon and nitrogen in their diets. These were animals that were eating fish in the low river and also eating a lot of um, fish out in the Strait of Juan de Fuca. And this is what this is right here is just a great baseline data for us. We weren't able to say anything about demographics. We didn't have enough otters, but we know that we can compare, compare this in the future and see how things changed. I will point out that this red dot um, was this otter here. She, after the lower dam came out, she moved downriver very quickly um, down past the lower dam. And unfortunately found the Chinook rearing channel was a great place to eat a lot of Chinook um, and was trapped by the state and killed um, for her fish eating habits. And so we were able to get another sample and we saw an increase in her marine derived nutrients because she was eating Chinook. Um, we also studied American dippers with the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. We had a postdoc on this project with a goal of examining, examining body condition of these river-dependent birds, river-dependent songbird. Um, we wanted to look at their body condition and demographics in relation to marine-derived nutrients in their diets. And we actually looked across four watersheds with varying access to salmon. We banded 246 dippers during our study. And we found that adult dippers with access to salmon on their territories were 13 times as likely to be year round residents on their territories than dippers without access to salmon. Dippers without access to salmon were more likely to migrate up and down river uh, during the non breeding season. We also found dippers with access to salmon were 20 times as likely to attempt multiple broods in a year. That's pretty awesome. If you can pull off two clutches in a year, you are really uh, increasing your lifetime reproductive success. So salmon matter <laughs> to these birds. Um, since dam removal, uh, we have been doing a lot of work in the, the restoring former reservoirs, what we call the lake beds. So again, just to remind us where we are, the former Elwha Dam impounded the Aldwell Reservoir and the former Glines Canyon impounded the Mills Reservoir. So Mills is the further upstream reservoir. This is 800 acres of new habitat for terrestrial wildlife. Um, and so we were really curious who was gonna move into these landscapes uh, as they were revegetated. And we were interested because we hypothesized that early serial stage vegetation would bring about the early successional and mobile wildlife like amphibians, like small mammals, and like mobile species like birds. And that as plant um, succession moved forward and habitat restoration continued and time since dam removal moved on, that wildlife would start to use and shape this habitat. 
And that the, as the riparian vegetation matured, the deer and elk would move in, critters would start using these plants. And then ultimately, um, we were interested in the aquatic terrestrial link linkages that may ultimately occur with what we're calling full, almost full habitat restoration, I guess, where we would get the restored complement of species that we felt that we knew were outside of these reservoir beds. These were animals that were in Elwha. I don't want to imply that these animals that I'm going to talk about were not already in the Elwha watershed. They were, but they didn't have this 800 acres of floodplain habitat to use. So in order to examine some of these questions, um, we did small mammal trapping surveys. We did ungulate pellet surveys to look at presence absence over time. And then we did browse surveys to look at the impact and then beaver surveys. We found a variety of small mammal species on both reservoir beds. Um, we had 14 different species using the reservoir beds, an increasing number of species each year that we trapped. And the vast majority of those 13 and 14 species were seen on the upper reservoir mills and 11 of 14 were seen on the lower re reservoir beds or Aldwell. The star of the show were the paramiscus, the mice. Uh, they were fearless, it seemed, in moving across these landscapes that were basically unvegetated. As long as they had some large woody structure, they seemed to be comfortable. Um, so vast majority of the numeric response was the paramiscus. Uh, deer and elk, we saw move in very quickly, um, particularly the upper reservoir and particularly elk. So we saw an increase in elk use of the upper reservoir, the orange one here throughout the years, and a smaller increase in black-tailed deer use over the years. Beavers. Beavers are amazing ecosystem engineers. We know that beavers were not along these lake shores prior to dam removal. So we wanted to do just really basic sign surveys. In 2014, we saw beaver sign in Aldwell only. By the next year, we were seeing beaver sign on both former reservoir, 2016, lots of sign. And now we have a very large beaver complex on Hurricane Creek in the upper reservoir. And we have been uh, fortunate enough to be able to put some cameras on these. And we've just really documented kind of an amazing array of use of species. We also put a really nice camera on a tree and then we came back and the tree had been cut down. And so um, we have a really nice camera somewhere in this beaver dam. <laughs> and this thing is like a highway. This beaver dam holds up for one thing to a lot of use. Um, we've got bobcats using this beaver dam. We've got cougars using this beaver dam, moving across it, investigating. And we know from our other work that cougars eat beavers. So whether they're hunting, who knows, but um, they're certainly using this. Bears are using this beaver dam. It is truly a super highway. Elk are using the pond. Um, this elk proceeds to walk over this beaver dam in this video and not break it down, amazingly. Great blue heron. Um, we also have a full, like a really large complement of wildlife species using this. Um, a lot of waterfowl, kingfishers, some bird of, birds of prey. So just a lot of critters just in that complex. So since dam removal, and now I'm mostly going to show you fun pictures until it's time for Vanessa to get up and tell us her amazing stories. Um, at this point, we are really using cameras to monitor wildlife in these former reservoirs. Um, we actually ha we actually have 10 more cameras on the Elwha Reservation now that are a camera grid being run by a couple of youth that are here in the front. Um, but we have 10 cameras on each former reservoir bed and then 10 um, in a reference reach further up river. And we're documenting just a huge amount of use of these reservoir beds. Um, deer, deer interacting with one another. We're getting elk um, of all ages, entire herds of elk. Um, bears scratching their backs. And interestingly, I really, I put this data slide up because I wanted to show you this little winter boy. If you remember the data from pre-dam removal from our telemetry, our radio tracking work, um, my graduate work, there, we didn't find any winter use down on the river. So we're seeing a little bit of winter use of bears on the river. 
Um, we're seeing a lot of snowshoe hair, a lot of snowshoe hair. They really like er early cereal habitats. And the most amazing thing, a fisher eating a snowshoe hair. Um, I don't know how many of you know that fishers were extirpated from the Olympic Peninsula. They were brought back in by the Park Service in the state of Washington. This was super exciting to get a photo of a fisher using the full, the former mills reservoir um, and eating a snowshoe hare in front of our camera. Mm -hmm. Coyotes, another really interesting story because coyotes are really only being seen on the lower reservoir. This is the most dramatic pattern that we're seeing. Um, and that is, you know, this is, this is a species that does well in a human dominated environment. And we are seeing that on our camera grid. Um, bobcats, we're seeing lots of bobcats, many cougars. And I would argue that as far as the plant establishment, we, we are, we are almost here. We are almost here. We are not at full restoration by any stretch of the imagination. Restoration takes a lot of time. Um, the, the human piece of the restoration story is going to take decades. And Vanessa is going to talk about that. The fish restoration story is going to take decades, but we are seeing some really promising early signs. And now I'm just going to show you some fun videos. We are seeing bears eating salmon on the former reservoir beds. We are seeing bears fishing for coho in December of this year, December. They're supposed to be asleep. <laughs> we have radio colored cougars that we're tracking on some of our other research that are using the former Elwha lake beds and hunting elk. Um, and so what we have here is a cougar eating an elk on the former mills reservoir. So we saw the plants, we saw the elk come back. We're seeing the cougars eating the elk. Um, we have another elk killed by a cougar here. Um, more recently, much more recently. And we've got a lot of animals benefiting from these elk kills and being chased off by the cougar who claims the elk kills. He doesn't want intruders. We're seeing the other species that use these elk kills interacting with one another and fighting over the meat at this kill. And finally, for me, as a wildlife biologist studying the Elwha, early restoration success looks like this. That is a cougar fishing in a stream and successfully emerging with a coho in December of this year. We were really excited <laughs> when we got this picture. This is still early. But this is pretty awesome. You know, on our restoration trajectory, we're seeing we're seeing a lot with the wildlife community. Um, again, this is early. It's going to take time, but we are seeing a huge complement of wildlife using these former reservoir beds and hunting there and now fishing there, which is really incredible. Um, you can find more information at uh, this bibliography, Zotero. Can also just look it up. There is every Elwha rester, every Elwha research paper is there. There's also right now an Elwha special issue in Frontiers in Ecology and Evolution. Uh, there are just 14 new papers just published there, and more coming every day. We just submitted one this week. And now I'm going to transfer you over to Vanessa to talk about the human dimension of what success looks like. The first piece of that for me is that we are um, engaging right now with 15 tribal youth. Um, and bringing them into the Elwha, showing them what is happening uh, in on their river and what is happening with these lake beds. And we have two of them right down here. Raise your hands, Audrey and Bridget. Um, and now Vanessa is going to tell her perspective. Thank you very much. Hey, Scotty. Ian Benson's not a Thomas Lanson. I am Vanessa Castle, or my given name is Ian Ben, and I am Column from Elwha. I am a member of the Lower Elwha Column tribe, but I am also a natural resource technician for the Lower Elwha, where I split my time half between fisheries and wildlife. So I get to do a little bit of both. 
But today I was asked to be here to kind of give a tribal perspective on the restoration and what led up to where we are now. And so I'll just kind of go through that. But since Kim's presentation was packed with so much information and so much data, I decided to take a step back from the scientific world and I'm stepping forward with my traditional ecological knowledge world and my personal, my family's personal experience on the Elwha. And I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to read from my notes a lot. And excuse me if I cough, but I'm getting over a cold. So right now, I would like you to close your eyes. Imagine yourself living in a Kalam village 300 years ago. You're sleeping in a cedar plank longhouse filled with many of your relatives. You're laying on the floor next to a crackling fire. The stench of smoke fills your wool blankets that you are wrapped in. Your woolly dog sleeps at your feet. Smoke swirls upwards towards the holes in the open slats of the roof of the home. Only a few fish left over from last year's catch lie tucked away in cedar boxes along the sides of the plank house on the benches. You are awakened by the sound of splashing. A roar comes over the house and everyone begins to stir. Men start yelling from outside in the dark of night. Satat yachi, satat yachi. They have arrived. You jump up and run outside of the plank house to hear the roar and splashing getting louder. You run over to the banks of the river to find the once still waters splashing with life. <clears throat> Shanu, our salmon, they were home. The water was so thick with fish that you could walk across the backs, our people used to say. They were our relatives that we had a sacred agreement with. We are salmon people, they live within our DNA. They have returned home for us just as they always has since time immemorial until they no longer could. Our connection with salmon was severed when we signed the treaty of point no point in 1855. Even though that treaty secured our right to harvest fish, it wasn't until <clears throat> the Bolt decision in 1974 that that right was ensured and we would no longer be prosecuted for feeding our families. Once fishing started to be exploited, we became criminals for harvesting our own food. Canneries were built on the mouth of every river. And over harvesting began. Over harvesting by the settlers began. Our fish was depleted. Shortly after this was followed by the atrocious concrete dams that were built on the Elwha that blocked salmon's passage. Not only did it block their passage to their sacred spawning grounds, but it also starved our river of any sediment, turning the riverscape unrecognizable to large cobblestones that salmon could no longer move with their tails to lay their eggs. <clears throat> not, only did the not only were the salmon hurt by this, but this was a direct attack on my people. We lived within the floodplains of the river, and when the dams, or if and when the dams ever broke, because they did, our whole tribe would be put at risk. This is our home. This is where we still reside. This is what I grew up fearing, that one day if the ground shook or if the structural integrity finally gave way, we had eight and a half minutes. Eight and a half minutes before two 250 foot walls of water would essentially wipe out my people. Our elders also risked their lives every time they stepped foot on the banks of that river to feed our family. If it began raining in the upper watershed, sometimes without us even knowing, the floodgates would be opened without notice and we would be chased into trees, sometimes stuck there and for days at a time until the river receded. When I was a child, I remember my uncle and my brother, every time we would go fishing, they would walk to the water's edge and shove a stick in the ground. If the river rose past that stick, it was time to go in fear that we would be swept away. My ancestors knew that the dams were going to kill all of our salmon from the first time they saw the salmon jumping at the base of the Elwha Dam, slamming their heads upon the concrete structure until they would essentially die in the pools below without spawning. They knew they had to fight our, to save our river and they did. That's why we're here today is to tell that story and the success that has happened since. My great great aunt Adeline and great aunt B who once taught me Klallam language in my younger years, traveled all the way to Washington DC to testify to Congress essentially leading to the passing of the Elwha Act in 1992. It then took over 20 years for us to begin to take those dams out. 
In the early 90s, I grew up fishing the banks of the Elwell with my mom. This was my first trip to the river. We would spend weeks at the mouth of the river at what we called fish camp. We had a relationship with our river. We had a relationship with our fish. I had teachings instilled from a very young age on how to carry myself around these sacred places and beings. The fish continued to deplete so much that my mother shifted to saltwater fishing by the time I was 13. We could no longer support our family from the river. And we began harvesting other things like crab and shrimp so that we were able to survive. It's me and my mother. Um, many others could not make ends meet once the fish stopped returning. Our sacred agreement with our relatives had been broken. <laughs> then the dams became to cut them down. Fishing was halted. We had finally won. We celebrated. We cried. My great great aunt Adeline was there to see the deconstruction begin. But unfortunately, she passed away in March of 2013. So she would never live to see the free river. But she knew it was coming. She knew and she was happy that her grandchildren would see it. All of my people were teeming with anticipation. There was so much unknown going into dam removal and there were teams of scientists studying the river as it all happened, coming from near and far to study what was going on. As we sat and watched and waited as both camp dams came down. We knew it wasn't gonna happen overnight, but we had hope. We knew that humans had done 100 years worth of damage to the Elwha. The fishing moratorium began and we no longer could feed our people from the river, but that was okay. We agreed to it. We wanted it to heal. And then four years of the moratorium turned into 10. Our anticipation quickly turned into sorrow. We agreed not to fish, but my people were suffering. 10 years was long enough for a loss of knowledge. Oops. A loss of teachings, a loss of connection with a whole generation of children, a loss of many elders during that time period. When we could no longer fish, a lot of us stopped even going to the river. We stopped bringing our children. We had no reason to. Some moved away like myself and we were given, and we were grieving the loss of our salmon. When I moved home, I knew that I want in 2018, <clears throat> I knew that I wanted to see what was happening in, on my river. I wanted answers. I wanted to know how the fish were doing. I wanted to know how the recovery was going. Where was my food? How were my relatives? So I did what any normal young person, young adult would do that had trust issues with the government and didn't like taking answers from other people. I started working for natural resources because I wanted to get my own answers. As a fisheries technician is how I started and that was the day I began healing myself and my relationship to reconnecting to my river. I began to start having conversations with people, with scientists and teams of people that were connected to the river, reminding them that there are people, actual people who are connected to this river. As a scientist, it's so easy to get wrapped up in the data and the numbers, especially because scientists, to be a good scientist, you are supposed to remain unbiased, that you for often forget about the people. To have a fully intact ecosystem, you must include my people, the first peoples of this land, who have symbiotically lived with the river since time immemorial. My people's connection to this river was deeper than any science could ever explain. And the restoration phase, phase of this project was very difficult on my people. Soon after I began these conversations, <clears throat> talks began of having a ceremonial harvest of salmon. And in agreement with our co-managers, finally, the tribe had decided that it was time for our people to begin healing. And this is also me working. Uh, we didn't know the river anymore. When the dams were removed, the whole river changed. The channels, the path, the vegetation, our old fishing trails, they were all gone. Everything had changed. It was unrecognizable once again, but this time in a good way. We would open a ceremonial subsistence fishery for coho salmon in October of 2023, the first ever since dam removal. 400 fish was all we were allowed to harvest. It was small, but at least it was something. We planned a small ceremony for the opening day, pictured above. So many tears were shed, so much laughter, so many smiles. The day had finally come and standing with my five-year-old son by, I stood and explained to him that today was the day that I would feed my 
feed my family from our river. My heart was so happy to think that he would never forget this day. That this would be a core memory for him. That day, I was on the river with my whole family. And it was the first time we had been on the river together. I rolled up my boots underneath my ribbon skirt and trudged out to my fishing spot that I had already pre-chosen after fishing the Ola for science. <laughs> my family took this amazing photo. This is my mother and my uncle who I used to work with in fisheries and all of their children. The first day I was lucky, I caught my limit, which was four fish to begin with. I brought it home, I cleaned it, it to my sister's house and all of my family showed up and we shared a meal this is what it was supposed to be this was the healing we hadn't been oh, we had waited a long time for this day when i got back to the office conversation started about if i could continue to fish for elders that could not could no longer fish anymore we all agreed that they would allow designated fishing for elders who were physically unable to get to the river I was honored to be able to help many elders feed their spirit again. One elder even cried when I brought the fish to her door and she said, my heart is so happy. I have been so fish hungry. There were so many new fish, fishermen and women on the river. I was able to witness many people catch their first ever salmon. I saw my people beginning to heal. But if you were to ask me, this is what the beginning of success looks like. Thank you. Oh, I forgot it. we added a slide. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> um, if you are interested in the Elwa story, and if you're interested in Vanessa's story, um, uh, this is a great film actually to watch. Uh, it came out in the last year. It's an episode on people of nature called Wild Hope, the Beautiful Undammed. Um, it tells uh, it tells the story of part of the story of dam removal and some of the the work that has happened on the river and the impact that it has had on Delaware people. So, I would highly recommend that you uh, get on there and watch that episode, thirty minutes long. Thank you. So, any questions we're able to answer now? Okay. <laughs> is there any data on other dam removal projects that show more long term trends and changes in biodiversity that can help us predict the restoration timeline? I mean, there have been many, many, many dam removals, but they've all been small. Um, so um, my answer is not that I know of and not that I hear a lot of people talk about. I could be wrong, um, but nothing at all of the magnitude of Elwa. We, we are a model and people are coming to us to ask. People are coming to the Elwa to look and learn and see what their dam removals might look like. Yeah. So because the Elwa is very different and it is a national park compared to other dams that have like agricultural areas, what would you say are the things that you're giving to other people when you go to dams or just universal things that you could say could always be done for others? That's a great question. <laughs> Can you repeat it, please? Oh yes. What what universal things would we share about other dam removals? I mean, from a science perspective, um, I would say you know collect as much baseline data as you can, and prepare to revegetate those reservoirs. Get your ducks in order with the plan, um, and just do as many baseline studies as you can. I mean, the the few little bits of advice that I've been able to provide um, at Klamath is like 
look at your bird communities. I feel like we kind of failed as a strong word. I regret uh, not looking at the, the, the bird communities at the mouth of the river um, prior to dam removal because they've changed dramatically. Um, so I think collect your baseline data and just prepare for change. Don't forget about the bivalves. Yeah. <laughs> Whoops. We didn't forget about them. We didn't forget about them. We tried to relocate them into a safe zone and they were still smothered by the amount of sediment that came down. So it was unfortunate. Let's see. What inspired you to work with the Kalan tribe and then how do you feel like it's impacted the way you conduct science? That must be for me. Um, what inspired me to work for the tribe? I am honored to work for the tribe. Um, I have been at the tribe since 2007. I am very, very fortunate um, that I was the first wildlife biologist um, at the tribe and have been able to just watch this program grow um, and watch the transformation of this river. And what has inspired me is just the heart behind this restoration and the desire to not only feed the people again, but but to record the science. I mean, the tribe is is on board with, you know, for the most part, with seeing what happens. You know, it is known that this is a model. And I just think it's been inspiring to see sort of the side by side um, human connection to the river and the desire to see what what changes in an ecosystem that is sort of dealing with this enormous human impact. So for me, um, I think I was inspired partly because I was already working on the Elwha. I was working in the system and the tribe was hiring and I'm like, I this it was new for me, um, but I've been there for 16 years now and it's been an honor of a lifetime. Thank you. Okay, so let's see here, back here, yes. You mentioned that the uh, dam removal at the Alwa River is considered a model for other projects. And I'm wondering if the uh, higher prevalence of privately owned coastland in Washington has any impacts on dam removal projects and whether that would make the process look different in Washington than uh, another state. The question is whether the high prevalence of private property on the coast of Washington um, would sort of change change the the narrative about dam removal elsewhere. I don't. I can't. I don't think so. So you're trying. You're wondering if the fact that there is a lot of private sort of tide lands in other places. I, I was wondering how people downstream would react to having a huge surge of sediments go through their properties and if people would maybe resist what would be better for the environment as a whole for just maintaining their own property values. Right. Well, well quite frankly, the properties on the west side of the Elwha that are at the mouth of the river have now a beautiful sandy beach and their property value has increased tenfold. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nobody's studying it. Which is which, yeah, which is yeah, never mind. <laughs> our ancestral village and our cemetery. But whatever. Yeah, it's a great question. I don't I don't know. Yeah. So many okay, back there with the mask and then here and then with the glasses, okay, the mask. Yes, you. Um, I was curious, I know that pink was the major species that was in the river system before the dam removal, but it should look Sort of the priority to restore the other more culturally I'm going to let you answer that one. So prior to dam being built, the pinks were not really the most abundant species. Um, so they were so prior to dams being built, the pinks were the most abundant that we know of. Um, for the priority for the tribe is all salmon. We have like culturally, we are connected to all salmon. We are salmon people. And so we don't prioritize a specific species except for coho right now because we are raising them in our hatchery for food and for subsistence harvest. So we will continue to focus on those because of that reason that we want to be able to sustainably harvest them. 
start thinking ways in factories right now? They are not, and they are returning on their own. We saw the largest number last year than we've ever seen in the outlaw. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. It seems to me that an important part of this story is the people and the connection that people have to the fish and the land. So how many people are taking that note as a take-home message when they're when they're proposing other dam removal? Um I, I I have one answer. I, I'm sure Vanessa has an answer to that. I will say that I um I went to a, an airing of the the Wild Hope film because I'm also in it from the science perspective um, with Vanessa. And so I went to an airing of the episode at the Ecological Society of America conference in Portland this year. And there were several tribal representatives there from various Klamath um, River tribes. And they, the scientists, we're not talking to the people. I asked them and I said, well, you should probably learn from Elwa because that was a problem. Um, and so they were trying to figure out how to communicate back to, you know, the people, what was happening on the climate um, to the tribes because there hasn't been a lot of communication. So that is the only answer that I know is just, it's sort of my shock at hearing that for that particular dam removal project. Vanessa might have a different answer because she has met with some of the Klamath tribal um, people that do know yeah. what's coming. So I think the biggest thing is, that's the whole reason I'm here, is to remind these future scientists in the School of Fisheries that you need to remember that all of the work you are doing is connected to people and usually first peoples of your land, of the land that you're working on and that you need to be making sure that you're stepping forward in the right way and making contact with those people and making sure that you're letting them lead. Thank you. Yeah. Um, the immediate release of the sediment had any negative impact on the surrounding water system. Henry mentioned about that, so or are there others? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it was a huge impact to fish. There were fish windows so you know there was there were drawdowns and there were periods of time that just dam removal didn't happen to allow fish to come up but i will say that was it was a murky murky river and we had um what's that and the benthic invertebrates yeah the definitely the benthic invertebrates you saw those numbers on that graph but we we happened to have you know uh banded dippers at the time and radio tagged otters and they they left the river. I mean, completely. They were using only tributary streams because I just don't think any of them could see anything. So there were definitely temporary negative impacts and everybody knew there was going to be, you know, that's a huge plug of sediment and mud to, to dump into a river um, and just really impact visibility for things that you need to see and breathe. <laughs> Things that need to breathe. <laughs> Leading that. First of all, thank you for an incredible presentation. So inspiring. Um, so much hope. So a lot of times when people talk about the Elwa, one of the first things they ask me about is, well, how many fish? And um, maybe sometimes the animals. But I've never heard anyone ask me, well, what about the tribe? How's it changing the tribe? And I, I'm very interested because you have such a personal story connected directly to the restoration of the river. If you could just give us a little sense of your vision of what success success looks like long term for the tribe. What is what's life look like at Elwa in 20 years if things go as you wish? Do we have time? <laughs> um, thanks, Linda. Maybe think about it. What the, the yeah, I mean, what success looks like for me and my family is making those reconnections with our river and make starting those ceremonies again that we used to have and starting to have the ability to sustain our people and our, our livelihood off of those fish, just as we always have, and making sure that our families never go hungry. So. Yeah. Um, in the next 10, 15, 20 years, what does human-assisted restoration look like? Human-assisted restoration on the Elwha. to that a little bit. So we have been doing human-assisted restoration currently. We have engineered log jams, and we have been 
um, helping the coho salmon move upriver into the tributaries. We've been relocating them, hatchery fish essentially. Um, and we will continue to do some of that. Um, we will be building a lot more engineered long jams on a section of the river, on the lower river. Um, but there's there's a lot of other things that we don't know yet, either how we're gonna assist or what we're gonna assist, or if it's even time to assist. We're try trying to assess right now still where the river is at 10 years post dam removal. So I think that's just gonna be in the works. And the vegetation piece, the vegetation oh, yeah. oh, piece, yeah. there's still a lot of um, dealing with non-natives and just trying to really like make sure that they don't completely take over the reservoirs, especially that lower one that just has a lot more proximity to a lot of non-native. We also have a lot of planting events. Next one is on Earth Day, if you guys want yeah, to here. Still planting. Yes. We'll cut it off here. There's a, a refreshments outside.